Thank you for inviting me here to Kyoto. Um, I'm on the executive of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association, and normally the secretary would normally have the honours of giving a, a lecture here. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Ian Lilly gives his apologies. Um, having the Congress in uh, Kyoto has a lot of benefits for me. Uh, my wife and daughter are Japanese, and we actually live about uh, two kilometres from where this university is, so it's always good to come back to Kyoto. Uh, the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association uh, was established nearly 90 years ago. Although the name was given to it in 1976 at the US uh, PP conference out in Nice, um, the actual Congress, uh, the actual association developed really in the late 1920s when a group of archaeologists got together and decided it would be good every three or four years to meet and to talk about updates on archaeology in the region. People like Van Stellenfels and Van Hecker. 1932 they met in Hanoi, 1935 Manila, 38 Singapore, and it goes on and on till 1976. And I will now concentrate on just the last 30 to 40 years and then I'll talk about the future. 1976, IPA was given its current name and basically the aim of IPA is to promote the cooperation in the study of prehistory of Eastern Asia, that's east of the 70th degree longitude and the Pacific region. It maintains scholarly communication through regular congresses, which is the main point of IPA, communications, and it also puts out the IPA Bulletin, which is now the Journal of Asian and Pacific Archaeology. And it's all online, free. In the last 30 years, IPA has grown from a relatively large organisation to one that has now over 700 members. Um, for those of us who were around in the 1970s, I remember in the mid-1970s trying to get some literature looking at Indonesian or Romano related ware in Indonesia, trying to go through the actual material in English. And for those that remember, there was very little around. 1978, we had Peter Bellwood's book, Man's Conquest of the Pacific, which to me was one of the first major uh, publications that covered the Asia-Pacific region. Um, talking to Peter Bellwood about this, it also reminds me that if you ever write a book, make sure that you sign a contract with the publisher that you have absolutely last say in the title of that book. Which, as you can imagine, Man's Conquest of the Pacific, I think it would last about one generation. From conferences in 1985 in the Philippines, Japan and Guam in 1988, where they had basically 150 attendees, to Jogjakarta in 1990, Chiang Mai 94, Malacca in 98. You're getting the drift, they're going from different countries around the Asia Pacific region to Manila in 2006, where for the first time in the Congress I sat down, there were two full sessions on Chinese archaeology in English. And for those who work in China, to have something in English of that magnitude was just amazing. For those who teach Japanese archaeology, if you can speak Japanese and you can read uh, Japanese, all three or four scripts, that's fine. If you don't, you have to rely on either a, a yearly magazine that comes out on updates in Japanese archaeology, uh, which is translated on the web, or you wait every three or four years for fantastic books on the archaeology of Japan. Thank you, Koji. Um, the Congress basically promotes uh, publication and discussion of what's happening in the Asia and the Pacific region. You don't have to be blind Freddy to realise major advances in the Asian region, particularly from the 1970s, from political stability, from the end of war, or we would think the end of war, occurring, the development of national institutions promoting archaeology within those countries for a variety of reasons, nationalism being one of them, which needs to be tempered at times, we're promoting archaeology within universities in Southeast Asia. In the Pacific, it's slightly different. We don't have many indigenous organisations, uh, educational organisations. Uh, for those of us who work in Papua New Guinea, which has a population now pushing 10 million people, uh, it, archaeology is taught in the University of Papua New Guinea, 
by two archaeologists, one an Australian and one a Papua New Guinean, and they may have four or five graduates every year. Again, from a population of 10 million, that's not very many. New Caledonia has a university. Uh, Christoph Sand is here uh, in the uh, New Caledonian Archaeology Service. There's a University of the South Pacific based in Fiji that does not teach archaeology. It used to. So these are problems facing archaeology today. What's the future of IPA? Well, providing people do archaeology in the Asian Pacific region, IPA again provides a forum for a discussion and also it also basically upholds ethical standards in prehistorical research which are raised from Congress to Congress. The future is pretty rosy, uh, not only for, for IPA but also for archaeology in Asia. It's just epiphenomenal to the major process of discovering the past in that region. But where do we see the future going? In the Pacific, I think we're just treading water. Until we can start getting Pacific archaeologists undertaking Pacific archaeology, then I think it will be a backward step in the next few years. Making archaeology relevant to archaeologists is simple. You wouldn't be here if it's not. Making archaeologists relevant to the communities in which we work in is a lot more difficult and should be our top priority. Getting publications back into those communities that support our work, whether it be in Asia or the Pacific or Papua New Guinea or the Solomons, getting students from those countries studying archaeology, getting them through the education system, which means sitting down with the curriculum development units of those countries and making it relevant to the scholarly stream within the schools, but also, more importantly, making it relevant for the communities who uh, we work with in those specific countries. And to me, that's the challenge for the future. But also, don't forget the pragmatics of this. Um, we're in a backdrop of... Uh, What's the word for it? Universities, which most of us work in, um, we're in a backdrop of government policy, which is reducing the impact of humanities uh, within the universities that, uh, that they exist in. My own university, or my own... I'm living in New Zealand at the moment. For the last 12 years, humanities has not been subsidised a cent since 19... I think for the last 10 or 12 years, whereas sciences have been subsidised quite a lot. This results in a, what we call a management of change. And in my own university, my own department is undergoing a management of change. Um, that simply means getting rid of people, by the way, to have a close alignment of resources and uh, expenditure. So that simply means disestablishing every position and then reapplying for it. Archaeology is not important in many societies. But it can be important for those societies that we work in. I'm proud to be a member of IPA, proud there for many years. For those who are interested in looking at the history of IPA, I recommend you a document that I was basically reading last night by Jack Golson on the history of IPA. Jack is here today. Uh, from FEPPA to IPA that came out in 1998. And also Miriam Stark, who also gives her apologies for not being here, wrote a very good paper in our new journal, the Journal of Asian and Pacific Archaeology, on the future of Asian archaeology. M. Tassel, thank you very much.